This is Twit. And we know a about many identity providers out there. And when you, you know, you log in, you know, your identity then is authenticated by similarly the same company that's out there. Now, I, I dare to mention Facebook or meta identities out there today. The site might take a Facebook login and then they really know everything about you and then they authenticate you. Um, and they kind of basically a centralized way of doing it. Now, we've heard a lot about the concept of decentralized identity. Can you maybe take us through what is it and really what the advantages of it is? So <clears throat> decentralized identity is um, uh, sort of best described in contrast to federated identity, which is kind of the world what we, we work on mostly today, where um, you have these organizations where you have an identity and you have other parties that decide to rely on on those main parties. So this is the login with GitHub, login with Facebook, you know, right. um, uh, those varieties. And um, the in this case, the trust in your identity comes from who you asked meaning the information that was passed directly through one of those federated identity providers rather than um, coming directly through the user themselves. And so the, the main concept of decentralized identity is that you have a core set of technologies that allow for um, the identity information to be passed along with the person who's authenticating, um, but still with that trust enabled. And that's done uh, with verifiable credentials primarily, uh, and, and it allows you to verify the information from an authority without having to actually communicate with that authority directly in any way. And, and that's the basic idea that allows decentralized identity to work. Now, it goes along with the normal concept of like personal identity today, where you can you walk up to somebody and, and you can show them some piece of identification and they understand who you are. And obviously it come, follows a similar concept. How, how does that happen in the digital sense, though? Well, so this is a really good conversation, right? Um, is that most of the, uh, uh, we talk about online identity, but let's go to like cards in your wallet, right? Um, I have uh, a driver's license as the classic example, and, and it's it's good for a number of reasons. Now, if I want to go go into a bar, they look at my driver's license to see if I'm old enough to be served alcohol, right? Um, and uh, and so that's a, a, a maybe an, un an unintended use of my driver's license. The state issued it to me to be able to keep track of who's authorized to drive a vehicle, um, but it gets used for lots of other cases. Uh, proof of address is one of them. Um, certainly I can use it when I go to the airport. Um, and so uh, there's all these sort of uh, side effect use cases of identity, and that's n not a bug, that's actually a feature. And federated identity doesn't really allow that today. It doesn't allow me to present the data that I might have from a variety of online you know, authorities or providers and, and present it sort of anywhere that I wish for whatever purpose. And so one of the side effects of, uh, of decentralized identity is that if I am issued a credential that has these verified claims in it, then I can go and present it to somebody else without the issue we're actually knowing or being involved. And that actually promotes a wide uh, variety of identity-based uh, use cases that aren't really supported uh, using the, the online identity models that we have. Now, we, we hear a lot about decentralized identity, how it relates to the, the Web 3.0 you know, concepts that are out there. How is this kind of relating? Is it, is it use blockchain technology? So it can, it doesn't have to. This is a, a large area of contention. Um, so blockchains turn out to be really great for high available uh, immutable data um, that, uh, you know, that, that everyone can refer to. There's often consensus mechanisms which makes them uh, attack resistant. And so uh, the short answer is, is no, you don't have to use a blockchain, but you need to be ready to solve all the problems that a blockchain does if you want a robust system to be built on it. So underneath verifiable credentials are, are usually uh, DIDs, decentralized identifiers. Um, that was a standard recently ratified by the W3C. And not all DID methods have a ledger underneath of them, but many do, uh, specifically because of the advantages that ledgers give you. But, but no, not technically required. Interesting. So, um, you know, we hear a lot about, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, identity and uh, you know, experts on the show, and they've talked a little bit about FIDO and the technologies that go along with that. How, how is it different? Maybe how is it, how does it complement uh, decentralized identities? So FIDO is primarily the idea that rather than using something like a username and a password, that you're going to prove key ownership. Um, and you do that by typically signing a challenge. Um, and often that's a hardware device or an app on your phone that helps you to do that. Um, decentralized identity takes that concept a little further in the sense that not only are you proving key ownership, 
but you can actually then uh, communicate uh, based on uh, your de decentralized identifier you did and, and actually interact with other folks as well. So it's it's a similar concept, but advanced further in, in a way that I think is really powerful for the internet. I mean, you've this probably come up on the show before you don't um the internet w was created without an identity layer primarily because all the people that were running it knew each other originally and so um as that expanded we kind of have never really gotten there the closest thing we have today is an identity layer is email addresses because you can both prove access to them and they're a method of communication and so fido does the prove who you are or that you you are in possession of the same hardware uh, uh, security token that you were last time, uh, but doesn't really solve the communication aspect. And so decentralized identity w ventures further into that road um, to to uh, for both communication and for portable trust and verifiable credentials. So it's similar ideas at the start, but it takes it a little further on purpose. Right. So decentralization and democratizes data and access. It sounds great. Sounds great for individuals, but what is really the real advantage for organizations? Like, what 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 what's the means for them to move to it? So, um, a huge example that's often overlooked is uh, decreased integration costs. Um, and I'll give you an example uh, that that we as a company have have worked with. Um, we did a pilot project with the island of Aruba and the and the health department of of uh, of New York State. Uh, this was mid-pandemic. There was a project already going on that CETA was helping with um, to uh, eliminate lines in airports when you arrive at a destination, but the pandemic showed up, and so the efforts uh, pivoted to, to focus on the pandemic. And as part of that, they wanted to know um, th uh, that um, the, the island wanted to know that you had a, a particular test, that you were either vaccinated or you had a negative COVID test. And uh, they didn't directly have a relationship, of course, with all the health departments that could exist in the US. Um, and so um, the technology that we use, verifiable credentials, of course, um, the, the, the subject was issued a verifiable credential of their test results and could then present them when they arrived in Aruba or actually in advance of arriving at, at Aruba as well. And, and the advantage there was that there's some governance, I'm glossing over a handful of things, but the governance involved meant that Aruba could trust the test results of a of a health lab that they had never communicated with or heard of before because of the architecture of, of making this happen. It, it's a little bit funny, but when you hand trusted data to the holder um, and, they, and, and, um, and they present it to the party that needs to verify that data, you're kind of sneaker netting trust. Um, you know, uh, we, we joke about sneaker net, you, you load something onto a, you know, in the old days of floppy disk or a, or a USB thumb drive, and then you walk it to its destination. And in some ways, that's kind of what we're doing with verifiable credentials, rather than worrying about how the issuer and the verifier, the, the, the data authority, and then the person that wants to verify the data, how they communicate, you simply give that data to the user. Of course, it's, it's tamper resistant because of the cryptography, and they just move it to wherever they, they need to take it with them. And so it solves a lot of integration issues. Um, you know, if, if you didn't have verifiable credentials, there was likely need to be a, a new organization created that that handled a whole bunch of database integrations and and, uh, and, and costly systems to run because they need to be highly available. Um, and verifiable credentials allow the same trust properties but without all of the high infrastructure costs in the in the in the requirements that are normally uh, involved with with uh, the integration of of multiple data systems. Now, one one question we always get from organizations out there, obviously, they like to hear about all the new technologies and, and methods out there. They're using, you know, standard IM structures and, and setups, um, you know, with uh, with normal open ID providers and so on. What would it take? for an organization, small or large, to move to more decentralized system? What, what is the kind of the process for them to do that? <clears throat> so there's a couple of different options that are emerging. Um, one of the ways um, to issue or verify, verify credentials leans on OpenID uh, Connect directly, uh, such that you can pass a credential over that same existing connection. Um, Microsoft has a product that allows you to um, issue uh, credentials out of uh, Active Directory. Um, and uh, and so that's a that's their sort of foray into offering uh, these sorts of things to enterprises. Um, and there's there's some new technology as well that's emerging that that um, that is different on purpose uh, from the from the other integrations because of the advantages that it gives you. Um, in the enterprise world, we tend to think that you you run stuff you, you run something like an API you you host the infrastructure and make that happen. That works well when you're talking with other companies or or or, um, or partners that also host APIs. 
a decentralized identity offers the potential for people to be peers rather than clients in interactions. And so uh, interactions that are, are adopting that type of stuff involves a little bit more uh, sort of deeper integration to gain those benefits. But there, you can definitely get started with things like OpenID uh, Connect um, and uh, and other other style of uh, other similar styles of, of interaction that, that work similar to or alongside the technologies that you have in place today in an enterprise.